Hey everyone, in this video, I want to talk about Azure NetApp Files, a Microsoft and Azure first party service using NetApp hardware. As always, if this is useful, please go ahead and like and subscribe. It's very common for us as an organization to use file-based protocols. We use SMB, we use NFS. And often I think about, well, I want to move to the cloud, but I don't want to re-architect my application to move away from those protocols. So we're looking at ways, well, how can I get a great NFS, SMB, maybe dual protocol solution in Azure? And so Azure NetApp Files brings me those capabilities using the familiar hardware. So what we're thinking about here is actually in the Microsoft data centers, we have these clusters of NetApp filers, the NetApp storage controllers. So I can think about there are these real clusters that we don't see like any other Azure service. We abstract away the physical fabric but there are absolutely these NetApp clusters deployed across multiple data centers and regions that is going to power this Azure first party service. It has a resource provider. This is just like any other Azure service. Now, when I think about the construct to actually use this, there's a, a hierarchy to create in the underlying volumes that we're actually going to connect to to consume this service. Now, if I think about Azure constructs first, we're used to the idea that we have an Azure subscription. So we have our Azure subscription, and we think of that as a certain boundary. So I think about, yep, there's my Azure subscription. That's a boundary for many types of things. And then within a subscription, I can create resources across multiple regions. So once again, then I have the idea of, well, I create things in a certain region within that certain subscription. And so the first part of this Azure NetApp Files solution is I'm going to create an Azure NetApp Files account. So that's our first layer construct. So within a certain region and within a certain subscription, so it is bound within the region, it's a regional resource, we're going to go ahead and create an ANF an Azure NetApp Files account. Now I can have multiple of these accounts. I can have up to 10 ANF accounts per region, but as I'm saying, it is bound within a particular subscription, a particular region. And that's really all it is. It's part of this management construct that I'm gonna use as part of my Azure NetApp Files. Now I'm gonna be creating things under this. But all those things under it do share a few common mechanisms that are lit up by the account. The first thing is, well, we're gonna be talking to this. We're gonna be talking to this via SMB, via NFS. Well, we use virtual networks as the container when I have network adapters, when I have IP addresses. So the way Azure NetApp Files is integrating is within that same region, within that same subscription, well, I also have a virtual network. So it has to be in the same region as the Azure NetApp Files account, but I'm gonna go ahead and I have a VNet. And the integration with this, with ANF, is another very common construct. We're gonna use a delegated subnet. So at the ANF account level, it is going to go and hook in to a particular delegated subnet into which it will actually go and create uh, network interfaces, IP addresses. Now in terms of the sizing, uh, slash 24 is the default if you were just going to go and create this from the portal. But the reality is most of the time a slash 28 is going to be big enough. So that would give you 11 usable IP addresses. If I'm some very, very large scale, high performance workload like SAP HANA, we are gonna probably work with a specialist and they may recommend a bigger number. But for the most part, um, that's actually gonna be all I need, a slash 28. Now what happens here is absolutely, it's gonna create IP addresses within that delegated subnet for the various volumes that we're gonna go and mount. But it's not one per volume, it's more about the account and certain performance characteristics. 
And what's actually going to happen is, if I think about there were these NetApp clusters, well, there were these virtual interfaces on the cluster. So I can think, hey, there's these virtual interfaces. And these abstract the actual communications to the actual clusters. And these IPs kind of map to these virtual interfaces. So this is how I'm going to go and get the communication to what is powering that Azure NetApp files. Now, because these are just IP addresses, obviously things in the same subnet can talk and mount these volumes. But additionally, if I had other networks, so for example, maybe I'm sitting on premises and I could be doing something like um, an express route private peering. So I've got a connection here that is connected to this. So this could be express route, private peering. Remember, private peering is private IP space to private IP space. It could be a site to site VPN. Additionally, I might have other virtual networks. Now, a key point here, though, is those other virtual networks. Yes, I could have another VNet. So I could have VNet2, and I could do peering. But it must be in the same region. I cannot do global VNet peering. I cannot have a VNet over here outside that region and then mount these. So it has to be in that same region. Now, there are different types of network options we have, and I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit more. There's a basic and a standard. Um, if I think about using the standard, well, standard sports fast path, so that ingress into the virtual network would bypass the gateway that normally allows the traffic to come in via a private peer and connection. There's another account level connectivity we think about. For some types of service, if I think about SMB, if I think about NFS 4.1 Kerberos volumes, i.e. it's encryption over the wire using Kerberos, well, it has to hook into Active Directory. So I can also think about, well, there's an Active Directory. Now, this could be Active Directory domain services hosted on Windows servers. This could be Azure AD domain services where it's a managed Active Directory but it's providing an Active Directory. And what happens here is I actually connect my ANF account to an AD. And what happens is we actually get a computer object and then we get various DNS entries that relate to the IP addresses. So the ANF account is basically joining the Active Directory. So I think about I need this if I want to do SMB or if I want to do NFS 4.1 Kerberos. I want that encryption over the wire, for example. So if I want those, we connect in the ANF account to Active Directory. I need at least one capacity pool, which we're going to talk about first before I can do this connection. But that is what is going to enable those functionalities. Now, this does mean this delegated subnet has to have line of sight to my Active Directory. It has to have the DNS resolution for that Active Directory to function. So that's that top layer, the ANF account, the management construct. Now what do I do? So the first real object I create under this is I'm going to create, let's use a different color, under the account, remember I can have up to 10 accounts per subscription, I'm going to create a capacity Pool. Now, in terms of those capacity pools, I can have up to 25 per account. So I can think about this whole stack of different capacity pools all going up to that ANF account. There's really two attributes I think about of the capacity pool. It has a service level. Kind of like the tier. So for the service devils, for Azure NetApp Files, there were three of these. I can think about Ultra, Premium, and Standard. And this is really driving the throughput per the amount of provision space. So if I think of Ultra, it's 128 um, megabytes per one terabyte provision space. 
Premium is 64, standard is 16. So what we can see here is, yes, there's different levels. Obviously, you're gonna pay more for the higher levels, but I get a higher amount of throughput per one terabyte of provision capacity. And that's the key point here. So it's a service level and it's a capacity in one terabyte chunks. So what that means is, as I buy the capacity, that I pay for the capacity I provision, not the amount I'm using, I pay for the actual provision capacity. So I might buy capacity because I need the amount of storage, or I might buy it because I need the amount of throughput. There is no IOPS number. There is no separate IOPS limit. The amount of IOPS you're gonna get is really just a function of, well, the, the size of the operations, the read-write mix, uh, and that throughput that is available to me. So this is what I pay for. I pay for the provisioned capacity. And so as you can imagine, what this means, if I'm paying for the amount of capacity, so I think, well, yes, I'm paying for an amount of capacity. As I pay for more capacity, so too does my throughput increase. So what I'm essentially getting here is, hey, I pay for more capacity. The capacity pool has a higher amount of throughput available to it which I'm then gonna use up by the volumes I create in it. Now that throughput is actually an interesting function because I have an option on the capacity pool because I can think about a certain quality of service. There are functions of Azure NetApp files that's gonna control the throughput for the volumes I'm gonna actually create under this. So I can also pick, well, for the QoS, do I want automatic or manual. If I think about this picture, so I've purchased a certain amount of capacity at a certain service level. So obviously if I pick ultra, that throughput is gonna be more, the lines more that direction. If I pick standard, whatever, but I'm gonna get a certain amount of capacity. If it's per tebibyte, well if I bought 10 tebibytes, well that's 1.28 gigabytes. Um, a second. If I bought standard, well, it's 160 megabytes per second. So it scales up. I'm then gonna create volumes underneath this. So I have the capacity pool, then underneath that, I'm actually gonna create volumes. Let's actually move this bit over a little bit. It's in my way. So we're gonna move that over to here so I can draw my picture a little bit nicer. There we go, give us themselves some more space. So it's gonna go to that. In an automatic mode, so if I think auto, this option right here, when I create the volumes, based on the capacity of the volume, it will use this mapped amount of throughput assigned to the volume. So I can think about, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and under the capacity pool, I'm gonna go and create volumes. In the automatic, if the capacity of volume was this, well then the throughput would be that. If I created a bigger volume, well I'm gonna get more throughput. If I create a little one, it's always squares. The amount of throughput is gonna match and correlate to the capacity. So that's the automatic mode. So what's the manual mode? The capacity pool still has the same dimensions based on the service level and the capacity, I have a certain amount of throughput. And that line is exactly the same. Hey, as I go bigger, so let's say this is my square, that's my size I went to, that's what I have available to me. If I select the manual option, well now at the volume level, I pick the throughput because maybe I don't need them all equal. Maybe I have some really small volumes I'm gonna create, but I actually need more throughput. So it's smaller, but I need more throughput. Maybe I'm gonna create some where it is more of that kind of square. Maybe I'm gonna create some where, hey, I don't need much performance. And then maybe, hey, so my sum is the same. I still only have a certain amount of throughput for the capacity pool, 
based on the capacity I provisioned. But if I pick the manual QoS option for my capacity pool, the volumes I create, I can specify what is the throughput I want. So I can pick whatever combinations I want, as maybe I have some volumes that need really, really high performance um, in relation to their capacity. Some might need lower. I have complete control over that. I can switch, it is possible, to go from auto to manual. So I can switch in that direction. So if I originally set my capacity pool as automatic and then decide, you know what, no, uh, I need some volumes to have different capabilities, I can switch from auto to manual. I cannot switch from manual to auto. So it's that direction only. So here I have these capacity pools and obviously the pricing is based on what is that service level? We can go ahead and look at the pricing and the pricing shows us based on if it's standard, premium or ultra, I pay for the amount of Gibby bytes per month. And again, the capacity ball I can provision in one tebibyte chunks. So I, I have that capacity and that capability to do that. Now what's important to think about here is I actually have a lot of flexibility. So we're used to the idea of many services that I can provision it and I can go upwards, but I can't shrink them. That is not the case here. When I think about this capacity, well that capacity can go anywhere from four tebibytes minimum to 500 tebibytes. So I have this great flexibility and I can both dynamically increase and I can decrease. As long as the underlying volumes in the capacity pool are less than or the same as what I want to shrink it to, I can decrease that size. So I can do that dynamic resize. I can also dynamically change the service levels. So I can go up and down the various service levels. Now, in terms of going down, Yes, I can go from premium or ultra to a lower level, but I can only do it after seven days. So I can go up at any time, but once I've gone up, I have to wait seven days before I can lower the service level of the capacity pool. So yes, I can dynamically change all of these things. I can dynamically change the size, up and down. I can change the capacity, the service level, up or down. But to go down, hey, I have to wait seven days after I've already raised it. But I. I do have that capability. So then to actually use this amount of provision space, we create a volume. And the key part of a volume is what I specify for a volume is a quota. And that quota can be anywhere from 100 Gibby bytes up to um, 100 tebibytes. And once again, these are dynamic. I can both dynamically increase and decrease a volume. Now obviously I can't shrink it below the amount of actually used capacity. But if I've deleted a whole bunch of stuff where I just wasn't using it, I can shrink it back down. Remember, the volume inherits the service level of the capacity pool. So the capacity pool has one single service level. If I want a mixture of ultra and premium and standard, well, I create different capacity pools under the account. So I can absolutely have that, but a capacity pool is one service level. If I was in that automatic QoS, its throughput is just based on its capacity. If I picked manual, well then yes, I can go and pick what is the throughput I want up to the total available that is currently unused in that capacity pool. I could automate this. I could write things like a logic app or an Azure function that looks at, hey, what's the provisioned and used amount of my quota? If I'm getting maybe within 90%, hey, let's increase the volume. It could even be smart enough to say, hey, um, I need to increase the volume, but the capacity pool is maxed out. 
well, let's increase the capacity pool and then increase my volume. So I can automate all of those various things. It inherits the service level of the capacity pool, but I can move. So one of the things I can do is I can move, let's change that, capacity pools. It has to be in the same account, but I could absolutely say, hey, I'm currently on standard, for example, I wanna be premium or ultra, and there is a premium or ultra capacity pool under the account, I can move it. Now, once again, if I move a volume to a higher tiered capacity pool, I have to wait seven days before I move it to a different capacity pool of a lower one. So once again, hey, I may have the option for QoS if my capacity pool is configured for manual QoS, then I'm gonna have that option to pick, hey, how much throughput do I want up to the maximum available in the actual capacity pool. So I might have that. Now there could be other options here. If I didn't set this to manual, obviously one of the things I could just do is, hey, we pick a size, maybe based on the amount of data we need to store, or we pick a size based on the throughput we need. So I might make the quota bigger than the storage to get the higher throughput that scales linearly with the capacity based on the service tier. So I could just make it bigger, if I find I'm having to make it a lot bigger, well then maybe I just need to pick a different service level. If I'm on standard or premium and I'm making these volumes huge just to get the throughput, a better option may be we just go up to a different service level, move it to a different capacity pool to get the throughput we need. Now another attribute obviously of the volume is the protocol. So we have options of SMB, Three. Remember, if I do SMB, I have to link it to Active Directory. It needs the Kerberos. Then there are NFS. So there's two different versions of NFS I have available to me. There's version three, X, and then there's 4.1. I can also do dual protocol support for volume. So it could be both SMB3 and NFS3, or SMB3 and NFS 4.1. So I can pick if I want dual. There's also a network mode of basic or standard. And this is all about the features that are gonna be available to me. So standard has features like uh, network security groups, user-defined routes. Um, the number of IPs I can actually have overall in the virtual network. There's a nice document that goes through the differences. So if we jump over, it talks about, hey, standard and basic. And then, hey, standard network features, basic, hey, I limit to a thousand. User-defined routes, yes, on standard. Network security groups, yes, on standard, no, for both those on basic. And it just goes through all the details. So I'll link that in the description below. But you can see it goes into the details on what all of those various options actually are. So I can pick that network integration. So I go and pick, hey, create a new volume. I pick the quota. I cannot over provision beyond the size of the capacity pool. So if I find I wanna add more volumes and the capacity pool is full, well, I can make the capacity pool bigger or I go and create a new capacity pool. I pick a protocol, SMB, NFS, maybe dual. I pick the network. Now obviously I have to go and mount it. So the whole idea here is now, hey, from this or this or this, wherever I want, my client would now go and mount the volume. And what will happen is it will tell you specifically how to go and mount it. Now, depending on if, for example, it's NFS or if it's SMB, Windows Linux, it will show you details about how to go and mount it. So it will actually show me there'll be a mount instructions and it will give me the exact commands to use to actually go and perform the mount operations. The documentation is phenomenal on this. The amount of detail available is huge. 
I don't think you're gonna have any trouble uh, actually configuring or using these things. But at this point, it's an SMB mount or it's an NFS mount. I'm just gonna go and consume and use these services. Just remember, hey, I, I have to have a line of sight to the IP addresses of that delegated subnet. Um, in terms of other functionality, um, there's things like snapshots. So we think about, hey, great, we have these volumes. Well, maybe I wanna capture point in time views. So absolutely, we have the ability to do snapshots. So I can think about, hey, at this volume, I can do something like snapshot. So that's a point in time view. I can have up to 200 and, I think it's 254 realistically. I think the docs say 255, but I think it's 254 is the real number I can do. So this is a point in time. This is all based around manipulating the pointers on the NetApp filers, which means it's super performant. It's near an instant create the snapshot. If I do a restoration, it's the same. It's super, super fast. The actual storage is only incremental. So it's only the delta changes between snapshots it actually has to store. So that's what it's gonna to consume towards my overall quota of the volume. So it's block level only, so it's super fast, super efficient. There is also a backup option. So backup supports up to 1,019 um, backups. I don't know why it's 1,019. Um, but one of the nice things I can actually do with the backup is I can offload. So I can offload to regular Azure storage blob. So I can take it off of my Azure NetApp files and move it off into blob storage and then bring it back if I want. And I can use policy to power both of those. To go and create the snapshots, create the backups, do all of those various things. It does have encryption at rest. So this is all encrypted at rest. It's using a platform managed key today, so that's what I have for there. And then the final thing I guess I wanted to touch on was when I think about, okay, great, I have these volumes, and I made this big deal that all of this is within a certain region, okay? But what if we have another region? I want cross-region resiliency, I want replicas. So what's actually happening behind the scenes, there are a whole set of pairings for the various NetApp clusters that exist within your region. And these follow both the standard pairings that things like Azure Storage use, but also non-standard pairings. So we can go and look, and it walks through the pairs of regions that are available. So yes, there are pairs of Azure NetApp file volumes across the regular pairings of Azure Storage, for example, but then they actually have non-standard pairs. So for example, I could go from East US 2 to West US 2. That is not a regular pairing that we could do, let's say for Azure Storage. And it talks about here, you pick the replication cycle. So I can do 10 minutes, I can do hourly, I can do daily. So I pick how often I want that replication to occur because there is a, a pricing element to that replication. And obviously that will drive my recovery point objectives as part of the overall solution. Now, one of the nice things I can do though, if I was to think about, okay, that's, that's that region. So now let's say within the same subscription, so really I could think about, well, actually that subscription is going further out, <laughs> going all the way out here. So it's the same subscription, but now I'm gonna think about a different region. So if I now think about, okay, I've got a region two, here, so different region, same subscription. In my second region, what I would do is I'd have a different Azure NetApp Files account. So I'd have, because again, remember NetApp Files accounts are regional. So this will be a separate Azure NetApp Files account. Again, it would have its own capacity pool. And what I can actually do here is it doesn't matter what this capacity pool was. This could be premium, ultra standard. So I'm running a volume on premium or ultra, but why would I wanna pay for that for my cross-region replica? I'm just wasting money, I'm not really using it, it's there for a DR scenario. So what I could do is I could set this to standard. 
okay? And then at the volume level, hey, great. So that capacity pool, I'll do my cross region replica. So it could be standard, premium, ultra, but I'm gonna to replicate to standard. I wanna save money. In the event of an actual failover and I actually have to start using it, remember I can change the service level of the capacity pool. So if I do a failover at that point, I could change this to premium or ultra. So I'm gonna optimize my cost until I actually have to use it. So this is a really nice feature to be able to optimize, hey, what I'm actually paying for. Now you might be like, well, when, when would I use this? Why would I use Azure NetApp files? There's things like well, Azure storage, there's other solutions. And it really depends. Things like Windows Virtual Desktop, FS Logic, integrates very tightly with Azure NetApp files. Things like SAP HANA, um, a data center migration, high performance computing. A lot of the times it's gonna be driven by the performance, which is super, super high, and latency. So these commonly talk about sub millisecond latencies. There is a comparison document. So if I'm not sure what to use, I can go and look at the comparison document. It talks about Azure files, and Azure NetApp files, it talks about the protocols. So obviously Azure NetApp files does dual protocol access. It talks about the regions it's in, cross region replication, the SLAs, I think it's a 4.9 for Azure NetApp files different types of capabilities, protocols, encryptions, snapshots, different SKUs, all different tiers available. But I think down here, it talks about latency. So your single millisecond latency is when you talk about Azure storage, it talks about sub millisecond for the Azure NetApp files. So it's really gonna depend on, well, what is my workload? but I'm gonna think in certain scenarios, maybe it's the protocol that's driving it, maybe it's encryption over the wire that's driving it, maybe it's the overall performance that's driving it, maybe it's latency that's driving it, maybe it's just familiarity with, hey, I'm, I've got some integration with on-premises that I'm moving this. But this is a first-party Azure service that's available to me, and hey, I use it like I would use anything else. Yes, there's Azure NetApp hardware, but you don't see it. It's a resource provider, I go and create an account, capacity pool, and I create volumes on it, and I go mount them. That's it. I just get a super amount of flexibility in terms of capacity, in terms of service levels. Grow it, shrink it, up the service level, down the service levels, move them around. I get a lot of flexibility in how, if I want to, have the QoS based on the volumes. And yeah. It's using a delegated subnet for the communication. It does require that Active Directory integration for SMB as part of the ACLs. And then if I want to use NFS 4.1 um, Kerberos to have encryption over the wire, it needs that computer account to enable that Kerberos-based encryption. But that was it. Um, I hope this little update was useful. And as always, until the next video, take care.